choir again for another inspirational song. I was going to apologize to you that in my sermon you're hearing the same thing that I preached at the early service, but then I realized you just sang the song, same song you sang in the early service, so we're even. So I listen to the same song, you'll hear the same sermon. So hopefully you all hear it for the first time. So uh, I want to talk just a little bit at first as we're kind of emerging out of this pandemic um, there's a lot of things I've realized for me that I've missed, and maybe for you too, things that we've missed doing. And one of them was going to see a movie. You know, I missed that for so long. You couldn't go to a movie theater and go see the latest movie that was going on. Uh, Netflix was nice for about a month or two, but, you know, after a while, it's just not the same thing. And um, I enjoy movies that have grand stories behind them, what we call the hero's journey story. Hero's journey is when they portray these big, long narratives where a hero goes on an adventure and they face conflict and there's growth and, and then they have allies that come with them and there's these grand moments where the good guys fight the bad guys and you have all these just beautiful experiences. Movies like Indiana Jones. I grew up watching Harrison Ford. He was one of my heroes as a kid. I wanted to be like Harrison Ford. You know, he had the cool hat and the jacket and the whip and he would fight the Nazis of World War II and he'd go look for that Ark of the Covenant. And by the way, um, they are currently, as we speak, filming uh, Indiana Jones Part 5 with Harrison Ford in it. He just turned 79. So I'm not sure how many boulders he's going to be leaping over and how many bullwhips he'll be cracking and how many Nazis he's going to be punching. But I got to give it to the guy. That is, I'm amazed at how active this new generation of retired seniors are. It's amazing. They just don't stop. They keep on going. So something for us to look to, you know, in our retirement years. But I love the Indiana Jones movies. Another one that was just perennial for me, it was one of my favorite uh, series growing up as a kid. If you know me, you know I love Star Wars. Star Wars was one of those grand sagas of movies. You know, I still remember as a kid, I was actually too young to watch the first one. My brother got to go first. Then I got to watch it later, finally, when they, my mom and dad said, okay, it's child-friendly, you can go. Um, <laughs> But I just won't forget the experience and the grand stories that emerged. The battle between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader or Yoda versus the Emperor or the scrappy rebellion against the evil empire. As I was thinking back of some of these movies that I've just cherished over the years, I realized for many of these movies, they oftentimes condition us to label or group people, don't they? When you think about it, they encourage us to group people in different groupings, the good guys and gals, the bad guys and gals, and they do it very deliberately. Like in Star Wars, you know that the, the stormtroopers, they all look alike. They all in the special armor and the same color and they march the same. And uh, you've got the, the Jedi, the Jedi who are the defenders, you know, of the faith there. And you know the Jedis because they have the blue and green lightsabers. But if there's a red lightsaber, that's a Sith. That's the bad guy right there. So it was very easy to tell the good guys from the bad guys. And here's the thing. When we label someone or a group of someones like this in a movie, one of the, the natural things we do next is we oftentimes choose sides. We have a favorite, don't we? We have a favorite. We go team, you know, rebellion. We are for the rebellion and we hope they conquer the empire. That's our favorite. Or maybe go team empire. We want to bring peace and justice to the world and rule with authority. Okay, whatever team you're on, you tend to kind of lean or fall when we watch movies like that. But here's the thing. When we step out of the movie experience, there's a temptation there to kind of keep that same mindset in our daily life and in our scripture reading right? Where we start to categorize and box groups of people together like that. Things like the wise Moses against the ruthless Pharaoh, mm. or the scrappy Israelites against the frightening Philistines, or maybe the amazing apostles against that jealous Jewish council. Say that three times fast. It's a little tricky. But here's the thing, especially that last one that I just shared about the apostles, that relates to our scripture for today, because we're in the series of Acts, and today I'm going to talk about Acts chapter 5, and this is verses 17 to 42, 
And the story or the narrative that is being portrayed here is about the persecution of the apostles. The apostles are out preaching the word of Jesus and they encounter opposition in the form of this council there. And so I thought, you know, one of the first things I encourage people to do, anytime we have scripture, I want to encourage you to personally take time at home to read. There is nothing better than using our own personal time to sit and live in the moment with Scripture. It impacts us in far different ways than me or someone else speaking it to you or sharing it with you. So I'm going to do something a little different. It's been a little interesting. You know, see, see, if, see what you think here. I'm going to do a little interpretation of Acts 5. So I'm going to talk about this story, the persecution of the apostles, but I'm going to frame it as if it were written like an epic Hollywood movie. And we enter the diabolical high priest, speaking to the captain of the guard. And the priest says, we have this insignificant band of rebellious apostles among us. Have them arrested. And the apostles are arrested and thrown into prison. And the door is slammed shut. But later that night, an angel appears among them to the apostles with cool special effects and CGI wings all aglow. And the angel says, go and share the good news right outside prison. Take this story, what you have learned in the morning, and share it with others. So the next morning, the high council is called together, and the order is given to bring the prisoners. The captain of the guard approaches the cell, unlocks the door, and finds the cell empty. That's right. And then some random person shouts, look, the apostles are over there. And there's this epic battle that emerges between the apostles and the guards. And they're tackling and battling one another to it. Wait, wait, wait. no, sorry. Stop, cut, cut, cut. So there's no epic battle, okay. They're taught to bring them discreetly. Bring them discreetly before the high priest. And the high priest approaches them and says, I told you not to think about that Jesus person. And brave Peter comes forward and says, you can't handle the truth. We will never obey you. We will only obey God. And the crowd gasps. They are enraged. Such insolence, such blasphemy. Let's kill them, they all say. What happens next, folks? apostles live to tell the story. Will the captain of the guard get his revenge? And who was that masked angel anyways? Tune in next week to find out what happens on part five, the return of the apostles. So that's the story of chapter five in Acts. Oh. So all week in my office, I'm having all these sound effects and Jack and Richard are like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> I'm living in scripture. It's fun. Come on, do it. Um, Here's the thing. Can you hear how easy it is when we read scripture or we tell the stories that we want to put people in teams, don't we? We naturally want to do that. We want our heroes. We want our villains. We want to put people in teams and then root for the ones we like. That's our human condition. But here's the first challenge for you and for me. When we read, whether it's this passage in Acts or any biblical passage, the first challenge I want to give us, caution against forming these teams. This isn't a timeless battle of good versus evil. No. This is a story of opposition. A story of opposition. Opposition is that human condition dealing with change within groups of people, right? That change that challenges us to reconsider what we've always thought and understood. And here's the thing about opposition. Believe it or not, there is healthy opposition. There is. Healthy opposition is not only good for us, it is necessary for growth and encouraging change in our lives and in the world. Think about the last time you saw your doctor. I know when I saw mine, my guess is he probably shared especially two different points with you. He says, make sure to diet and exercise. exercise. Good, you guys remember. <laughs> Just making sure. Diet and exercise. So how do we exercise? Well, in order to build our physical strength, we need something called an external resistance. 
something outside of us to cause that resistance so we can continue to exercise our bodies. Now, they might come in different forms. They might be resistance bands. Have you, I don't know if you all ever seen those. These rubber bands. And I've, I love, because I go to a gym and I love watching people use them because they kind of put them around their legs and they do this like duck walk thing. Bands, trying to walk with it, trying to stretch the legs and muscles. And it's kind of fun. And yeah, I probably shouldn't laugh, but so. Um, but they've got things like, resistance bands or things like weights, you know, hand weights or barbells, different weights that we use that external resistance to build muscular strength or maybe a machine. You know, ever been on a gym machine, any kind, there's dozens of them out there. You know, you go to a gym and there's bunches of them. The reality is those are important to help us build our physical strength, but it's not only, opposition is not only important for us physically, it's also important for the church. And this is where Matthew Skinner was going in our book series. We're doing this series on Acts, and I love this quote that he lifts up in the book series, and I want to share it with you. Uh, he says this. He says, Sometimes opposition drives us to understand ourselves better. In other words, through experiencing opposition, we might clarify and recommit ourselves to who we are, what we stand for, and what we want. Think of those early apostles. What were they doing in front of that high council? They were clarifying who they were. Guys, we're not this. We're followers of Jesus, right? That moment of opposition gave them clarity. It gave them the ability to recommit themselves for who they knew they were. So my question to you now is, when have you experienced in your life maybe a time of opposition, maybe an individual, maybe a group of people, that helped to better define you. What experiences have you had that have helped shape you? I know for me, one was going back to my internship in my grad school years. Uh, in graduate school, I was in the School of Education for Music, and I was being trained to be a music teacher, and you're required to internship. You have a junior and a senior. And on my junior internship, I was sent to a middle school chorus, and I was sent to a, they, they, all, the, all the good positions were filled. I was kind of last minute filled. And they placed me with a middle school teacher who was a second year teacher. She was a piano uh, teacher, piano major. And her dream in life was to be a performer. She wanted to go out and perform and play and do all this stuff. Well, she never was able to do that. And here's the thing. She didn't like to teach. And it was sad. I was literally in class with a person who not only didn't like the kids, she didn't like her job. She literally didn't want to be there would grumble about trying to make it as a, a performer. And I remember walking away from that experience going, I don't want to be like that. That's not me. That helped shape me. As tough as that opposition and that experience was. How about you? So going back to Acts chapter 5, I want to talk for a moment about the Jewish council. Here we have this Jewish council, and they are in opposition to what the apostles brought in this new teachings about Jesus. And the first caution I want to give is we want to be careful, just like I shared earlier, to not to label this Jewish council as the bad guys. Here's the thing. They were not bad guys. The Jewish council was even struggling themselves with their own issues of division and strife within the group. Because remember back then, the Jewish council had multiple different groups in their making. Two in particular were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Remember those names? The Sadducees. They oftentimes didn't even agree with each other. Theologically, they would fight and argue and battle over things, over big things. Like the Sadducees didn't believe in an afterlife. They said, nope, once you die, that's it. It's over. And the Pharisees are going, whoa, wait a minute. No, there's something after death. Let's talk about this. And so here's this council that, you know, is used to having their own times of opposition and conflict there. And yet we have these apostles emerging in that moment as well. See, and whether we're talking about the apostles or the Jewish high council, they were all children of God. Now, this council was seeking to follow the law the best that they knew. This is what they were taught as children. It's what they grew up learning uh, in their years of study there. And they were doing the best they could with what they knew. And the apostles were also doing the best they knew. They were living out these new teachings from Jesus as well. And the person I want to focus on in this moment is a very interesting gentleman. His name is Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel is a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law. He was on the high council at this time. 
And here's the thing. Gamaliel was respected by both parties, by both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They both saw him as a very learned man. They respected him and his authority there. And so after this big blow up with the apostles, they send the apostles off to say, okay, the council has to talk now. And Gamaliel comes forward and addresses the council. And what he says, I think, gets to the heart of this story. See, Gamaliel first reminds the high council that some of these previous opposition leaders that they've experienced in life. Remember back when this particular individual rose up with this group and it dispersed. And this person over here rose up with their following and gathering and that fell apart. And so what he tells them, he says, look, if this, meaning the apostles, if this is of human origin, it will fail. But if this is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In fact, you might even find yourself fighting against God. You see, the Jewish leaders of the time struggled with change. They'd seen these things happen before. Groups rise and groups fall and groups rise and groups fall. And they realized in that moment through Gamaliel that they might be wrong about this. And they began to see even slightly from a different point of view. So what does this mean for you and I today? I just want to give you two simple points and get you out early for lunch so we can beat the Baptist to lunch. So I'll keep it short. Number one, don't characterize people or groups whom you're in conflict or in opposition with, okay? Don't place others in this box of good guys and gals or bad guys and gals. Don't label as for or against. Don't simplify the moment by just simply grouping it and assuming that's what it is. See all people first as children of God, all of us. Number two, when facing times of opposition, seek to use this thing called holy conferencing. Now, John Wesley talked about this, but he had a different name. He called it Christian conferencing. What this is is a process of bringing grace into tough conversations and moments of opposition or conflict. The ability for us as groups, as individuals, to have something called civil discourse. Emphasis on the civil. To be able to speak truth and love because both are needed and both are necessary. And so a bishop by the name of Bishop Sally Dyke, who was a Methodist bishop uh, some years back, this was back about 10 years ago, wrote this article called The Eight Principles of Holy Conferencing. You can find it online. You can just Google Eight Principles of Holy Conferencing and you'll find the document. I'm going to share four of them with you this morning and want to encourage you to explore the other four, four on your own. So the first one she shares says this, says every person is a child of God. And not only is every person a child of God, they deserve to be treated like one. That's big. The apostles were children of God. So were members of the high council. So are you. And so is the person or people that you're in opposition with right now. We are all children of God. Can we acknowledge and respect the divinity that is placed within each of us? Number two, listen before speaking. I've had a number of conversations lately where this has been an overriding theme. I've heard time and time again, one in particular, one man sharing with me said, Jeremy, you don't understand. One of the biggest problems we deal with is we just don't listen to each other anymore. We talk past each other. We talk at each other. We're not even listening. When the other person's talking, we're not even listening. We're performing in our heads what we're going to say back in that moment. Can we stop? Can we truly listen? Listen to their story that they're sharing. And not only listen to the story, can we listen to the heart that's behind that story? Why this is important to the person, why this is important to that group there to help us understand more deeply, which takes us to point number three. Strive to understand from another's point of view. That old adage you may have heard, you know, can you walk a mile in their shoes? You see, we are called in Christian faith to live a life of humility. And to live a life of humility requires, it's not optional, requires us to concede that there are more perspectives out there than just our own perspective. 
That's what Gamaliel tried to teach to the high council. He tried to open their eyes and say, guys, there is another point of view here. Can you take a moment and see it? Strive to understand that point of view. Fourth one, disagree. This is one of my favorites. Disagree without being disagreeable. You know, uh, and, you know that's a fun one. Bishop Dyke talked about it, and she, and she had a very powerful, she's just very brilliant in her writing. She says, it's been said that in order to change the culture, we must change the conversation first, Right? And in order to change a culture of disharmony, we have to change the conversation so we are not denigrating each other, but respecting each other, even in our disagreements. It's like that old saying, how you say it is as important as what you say. See, the story of Acts is about this early growth of the Christian movement there. And in that journey, they encounter, just like in this passage, times of opposition. And in these opposition moments, they're mixes. They're mixes of what was, and we see that with the high council, and that's valued, and that's important. We don't want to lose sight of that. And it's alongside a new way of thinking, brought about by the apostles and what they learned by walking with Jesus. And the challenge for you and for me is, can we honor what is what we've always known, what we've always understood, and are we willing to open our eyes, to open our ears, to see and hear these new perspectives brought forth by the apostles of today? And folks, there's apostles out there today preaching this. Can we open our eyes and ears? Can we approach times of opposition or moments of conflict like Gamaliel does and be willing to see another perspective and maybe just maybe admit sometimes we could be wrong in that. So here's my prayer for you and for me. Let me tell you, I'm, I, I always, when I write sermons, I write them for me first because I got a lot of growth to do. My hope is maybe you're on that same journey with me. I'm hoping for me and maybe for you too is that we might value this Christian conferencing. When we have these times of opposition, and it's a matter of time, if you're not in a, in a time of opposition right now with a person or a group, it'll happen. Believe me, you know, that's a part of life. It's what we deal with. But when those moments occur, can we remember that they are children of God too? And can we take the time to truly listen to them not to just hear their point of view, but to strive to understand it and to be respectful for one another in our own civil discourse. And here's the beautiful thing when we do that, folks. You might be surprised to discover that what we have in common with those whom we oppose is far more valuable than what divides us. That's what helps keep us connected as a community with each other, and with God. Let's pray. God, as we wrestle with the book of Acts and these moments of opposition, it can be tough for us. It's so easy for us to lump things into groups, to pick the good guys and gals and the bad guys and gals and to pick for our team. Lord, may we stop in those moments. May we truly see the other individual or groups as children of God, just like we are. May we continue to remember to really listen, to hear their point of view and understand, to give that respect to one another, that we are called to be the Christian body together and being connected to you through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, before we go, I want to introduce you to another community that I'm a part of. And that's the picture up here on the screen. I'm a part of the Star Wars community. Now, something you might notice, I had the opportunity back in 2017 to go to Orlando and hang out with 70,000 Star Wars fans. Let me tell you, there were Jedi, there were Sith, there were rebels, there were Empire soldiers, there were good guys and gals and bad guys and gals and neutral people right in the middle. And they had discussions. Let me tell you, they could not agree on everything. You had the old people like me, because I'm an old guy in Star Wars, and they would say, there's nothing more than the original trilogy. You know what? This is what matters. This is canon. And then you had others saying, no, 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 there's more. There's this thing called the, the prequels that were created and that expanded the Star Wars saga and genre. We need to include the prequels in as well. And then there were the newbies. 
These were the young ones that came in and said, but what about the new sequels that just came out with Disney Plus? And all of them would argue, and all of them would discuss, and all of them would date. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, oh, we lost the picture. At the end of the day, this would be that. They would be standing shoulder to shoulder, no matter how much they argued, no matter how much they abated, no matter how much they opposed, what they thought about it, they were one group there in their love of Star Wars together. Now, here's the thing. You and I are in a community as well, and we call that Christian. And Christian community is far greater and far more expansive than any social group or any sci-fi group or any convention there is. But here's the thing. We're going to disagree at times about things. But we are all called to build the Christian community together. The book of Acts doesn't give up on God's people, on any one of them, and neither should we today. God bless you, and go in peace. Amen. 